What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. I know, I know, y'all want to hear about my opinion on Alfred Morris versus Matt Breida. Yesterday, we heard the unfortunate news about Jarek McKinnon tearing his ACL at practice, which leaves these two running backs, Alfred Morris, Matt Breida, to handle the backfield workload in San Francisco under Kyle Shanahan. Now, I've been kind of scrambling all morning to get my notes. I didn't want to throw an opinion out there right away because... I wanted to make sure I got all the facts. I wanted to check the big facts. I wanted to make sure I was spewing big facts only to you. So I've been scouring Twitter. I've been scouring the interweb. I've been scouring underneath my desk to see if I have any notes back from March or April on either of these two running backs to know what we're bringing to the table. Pretty sure I'm done wrapping up my analysis, so I want to bring this to you as early as I can because I know a lot of y'all are drafting today or a lot of y'all have these players on your waiver wire. So we're going to do just that. We're going to get into the video and I will kind of break down both players, how I see this backfield playing out and why, why you should or shouldn't pick up both or either of them. So let's just get right into the video. Okay, so I'm just going to be reading off the notes that I have here. It's all chicken scratch. It's up on my website, on my blog, if you want to check it out there, bigdogsfantasy.com. Here's what I know for certainty. You want a piece of this backfield. doesn't matter which one. I mean, it does matter which one, but either way, if you can only get one of them, if only one of them is available on your waiver wire, you do want to get that. If you look at this tweet from Graham Barfield, here's the obvious reason why you want a piece of this backfield. Over the last four years, as OC or head coach, Kyle Shanahan's backfield has finished 10th, 8th, 7th, and 12th in running back touches per game. Shanahan's backfields have finished top 10 in yards from scrimmage per game in three straight seasons. So he's been top 12 in the last four seasons in terms of RB touches per game. In redraft, you chase volume. Their running backs are going to touch the ball, whether it is through the air, whether it is on the ground. They're going to get a lot of touches, and as you can see, top 10 in yards per scrimmage over the last three years. They're not only getting volume, but they've been super efficient. Um, so he's just a goddamn wizard when it comes to churning out fantasy goodness uh, in, in the running back position over the last few years, right? Just the way his system is set up, and that's and there's no arguing that. And that's the reason why you had to have been so high on Jarek McKinnon this summer prior to the calf strain injury, which I told people after that happened, I, I put him on my do not draft list pretty much. And I said the reason why is because when you suffer these preseason injuries, guys, if you come back too early, you have a very high chance of either re-injuring that uh, that part of your leg or injuring another part of your body because when you have an injury in your lower leg and you come back too early, that, that muscle is not ready to take on a full workload. So another part of your lower leg compensates for the work that that muscle cannot or that tendon or whatever it is cannot account for. It's just, it's just doctoring 101. I'm not a doctor here, but it, it, that's just obvious common sense when it comes to that. And that's why when these lower leg injuries occur and I see players rushing back to their spot, I'm completely avoiding those guys. That's just a little note for you guys' future. Um, f for guys that are injured now or guys that you were thinking about and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do with these injury settlements. But anyways, let's break down both guys, right? If they're, Like I said, if there's one guy available, then you go for that guy. But if both of them are available, then of course you, you have to choose one or the other because you're probably not going to get both unless you spend a lot of your fab budget and I don't suggest doing that. So we'll look at Alfred Morris. And a lot of people wanted to immediately write off Alfred Morris, right? You hear Alfred Morris and you think of 2013, 2014. Alfred Morris was quietly very good last year. He uh, ran the ball 115 times. He was on Dallas. He was the backup on Dallas. He ran the ball 115 times for 547 yards, which is 4.8 yards per carry. Kyle, uh, Kyle Shanahan knows him and he trusts him, right? Because he played under Kyle Shanahan a few years back. Last year, Morris was the number 10 ranked running back per Football Outsiders in DVOA. So in terms of just efficiency overall, Football Outsiders had Morris ranked very highly. Um, he averaged 3.3 yards after contact, which among 73 running backs with 50 or more carries last year, ranked fifth in the NFL, 3.3 yards after contact. So Morris has definitely still got some sauce to him. He's still got some juice left in that tank of his, man. He played under Shanahan back in Washington. He had multiple thousand yard rushing seasons with him, knows the system well. He was just brought in a couple weeks ago and he played in this preseason game um, last weekend and he, and he rushed really well. The holes were enormous. Um, but he, he looked really, really good in this preseason action. It was the first of the summer, so it's good to see that he has been staying in shape and that he's ready to roll had they needed him, and now they obviously do. Um, now, Alfred Morris is 29. 
And usually, you know, when, when they start getting up there, you start writing running backs off, and you're like, oh, he's old, he's 29, he's 30, you know, he's probably going to break down soon. However, he doesn't have, like, the touch count that a lot of 29 or 30-year-old, 31-year-old running backs do, right? You look at Shady McCoy, and, you know, while it's not really a valid argument because he's proven this to be wrong, but you look at Shady, and you're like, oh, he's, like, 30, but he's also handled, like, 20,000 touches, you know what I mean? Alfred Morris only has, I think I wrote the number down. Alfred Morris, this is uh, his going to be his seventh year. So he's played six years in the NFL. He only has 1,262 carries overall. Um, so he's not a spring chicken by any means, but he's not as seasoned and he hasn't taken as many hits as most of the other backs that are this age that you expect to handle a big workload. Um, plus, he's only seen 184 carries over the last two years. So that's not a big workload. So his legs should be pretty fresh. Uh, the beat report is out of San Fran. Have Morris as a starter. What I'll say is don't get don't get locked up in the starter talk, right? Whatever Kyle Shanahan designs as his first play of the game, whatever that is going to be, is going to dictate who the starter is. If it's going to be a pass play, maybe he starts Brita out there, and everyone's going to go nuts. Oh, I knew it should have been Brita. The next play, Morris might come in for a running game. So don't worry about the starter talk. Worry more about who's getting the overall snaps, and that's something I will cover throughout the season, obviously. Um, in my weekly videos, I'll talk about running back committees and, and that kind of stuff. But that's kind of what I have for Morris, right? He's a guy who... Played well last year, knows the system, um, and he's played well already this preseason. Despite him being kind of old, he still has somewhat fresh legs. So that's Morris right now. We have Matt Breida, right? He was an undrafted free agent last year out of Georgia Southern. Really burst onto the scene and surprised a lot of people. We had Joe Williams, the hand-picked Joe Williams by Kyle Shanahan, who ended up just getting released. I wonder if they regret that now with the McKinnon injury. But Matt Breida um, ended up taking that second-string role last year. And as a rookie, he put up uh, 465 rushing yards on 105 carries, Two touchdowns, 4.4 yards per carry, 21 catches on 36 targets, 180 receiving yards, and an extra touchdown there. Um, almost 650 total yards as a rookie, three touchdowns. Was very involved in this offense, a lot more involved than people assumed going into the season. He missed this basically this entire preseason with a shoulder injury. Uh, last year, just like Alfred Morris, I said, was pretty good per Football Outsiders and their DVOA efficiency. Matt Breida was even better. He was the number fifth ranked running back in Football Outsiders DVOA. So all around a very good rookie season, all around uh, very surprising. He, he just turned out to be a much better prospect and a much better NFL running back than most people thought he was going to be. The question now becomes with McKinnon out, how much does Breida's role change with McKinnon gone, right? He was probably set up to be the second guy on the field behind McKinnon already, right? Probably somewhere from like five to seven carries a game and maybe... Uh, two to three catches a game. Does that change now that McKinnon is out? I saw Evan Silva kind of write that he sees Matt Breida playing the Tevin Coleman role, right? Because Shanahan was the OC for uh, Atlanta a couple years ago when Devonta Freeman had his big years and um, Tevin Coleman was the number two there. So Evan Silva sees Matt Breida as the Tevin Coleman, Alfred Morris as like the number one here, which makes sense because when you look at Matt Breida's profile, right, he's a smaller guy, 5'9", 195 pounds. So he's not really built to take on a huge workload. Um, he, he proved last year he can catch the ball, very good athlete, so you can use him in a lot of different ways, which is the same way that the Falcons use Tevin Coleman, right? They're comfortable using him um, rushing in between the 20s, they're comfortable rushing him outside, they're comfortable using him in the pass catching role as well. So Reed is a guy who's smaller, he's not going to be getting 20 to 25 touches a game, but he can be very efficient with the touches given the offensive scheme. At the end of the day, it's really, it's really close for me, right? And like I said, I would absolutely try to get at least one of these guys in your league if you can, but I'll look at it this way you have to think of like why were we so excited for Jarek McKinnon this year or why was you know why was I supposedly so excited for Jarek McKinnon this year and what part of that translates into the running back by committee we now have between Morris and Matt Breida now the reason I love McKinnon coming into this year it wasn't because I thought he was going to get 250 275 300 carries that's not the case and I don't think that was ever going to be the case the reason I love McKinnon was going to be his involvement in the passing game Last year, Kyle Shanahan turned Carlos Hyde into like a receiving stud. He caught 59 balls on 88 targets. Hyde caught 59 passes last year. That was very, that, that's, a, that's a ton of balls, especially as a fantasy running back. That is huge for your outlook, right? So he caught 59 passes. Alfred Morris has been in the NFL for six years. Alfred Morris has caught 57 passes in his entire career. Hyde last year caught 59 balls. Keep that in mind. Alfred Morris, this is per Scott Barrett of PFF. Alfred Morris played 1,362 snaps with Kyle Shanahan in Washington, totaled 26 targets. I didn't do the math on that one, but that would be, I think he gets a target on like 4% of his snaps or something, which is huge low. Basically, Alfred Morris was the Jordan Howard before Jordan Howard existed, if you look at it that way. 
Now, the reason I love McKinnon, again, wasn't because of the carry total I thought he was going to get. The reason I love McKinnon was because of his involvement in the passing game that was going to happen in 2018. Shanahan understands that throwing to your running backs gives you such a advantage over other NFL teams, and it's such a successful thing to do, and that's been proven this offseason by Warren Sharp, talked about it all in his uh, 2018 football preview. You look at the teams that do that the most, the teams that pass the ball the most to their running backs, right? San Fran targeted their running backs on 28% of their passes last year, which was the second highest total in the NFL. The only other team that topped them in terms of percentage of their passes um, where the targets went to running backs was the Saints. They were at 33%. San Francisco was at 28%. Guess who's number three? New England, 27%. These teams know what they're doing. These coaches know what they're doing, and they're evolving to the times. They were going to use the running back catching ability of Jarek McKinnon uh, as such a big part of this offense. Now that's gone. However, you still have to assume that that's going to be a big part of their game plan. Like They can't change things now just because Jarek McKinnon is out of there. Now, Morris has 20 receptions over the last three seasons. Matt Breida, last year as a rookie, had 21. So he had more last year as a rookie than Alfred Morris had as uh, over the last three seasons. However, 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 I'm not sure Matt Breida is an amazing um, pass catcher. And I'm not sure that just because Morris hasn't caught the ball much in this offense, that he doesn't get more involved and they just don't kind of shove him into close to that. Definitely not where McKinnon was going was gonna to be. I, th- I, th- I, th- I had pegged McKinnon to catch somewhere between like 65, 75. Ceiling of 80 catches this year. Um, but now with him gone, I could see Morris getting shoved into maybe like 35% or 40% of the running back targets here. Um, and that would be huge for fantasy purposes. And the reason I say that, and I want to bring up a tweet by one of the big doll writers, uh, one of the new writers that I brought on this summer, FB God. I would very highly suggest you go follow him on Twitter, at FB God. I will link that down below. Matt Breida, college receptions per year, 8 311. His catch rate last year, 58.3%, 45th amongst running backs. 36, <coughs> 36 targets, 6 drops. Sure, Alfred Morris isn't a pass game specialist, but Breida hasn't proven to be either. Now, a lot of people just assume that Breida is because he caught you know a decent amount of balls last year. 21 is, is really nothing crazy, but they put him into that role. And anytime you are running back in Shanahan's system, the pass catching role is going to make you look better than you are, i.e. what Carlos Hyde was last year. And you look at his college target share, it was 6.5%, which was in the 35th percentile going back to it. And that's per player profile, that image I brought up before. So while we kind of assume Breida is going to uh, take that role, I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if Alfred Morris actually ended up receiving more or caught, you know, if he ended up catching 25 to 35 passes this year, which is going to be a huge boost to his role if he does end up, um, if he does end up staying healthy, right? And he will be the early down workhorse here. So what I said, you know, it, it, run, throwing to this to these running backs are going to be a huge part of this offense because that's what Kyle Shanahan's system is. However, I'm not so sure I'm sold on Brita, you know, catching 65 to 75 passes this year. What I will say is, in a full PPR league, Breida will be my choice here because he will be more involved than Morris. I think realistically, Morris maybe gets 30 to 40 percent of the targets, but Breida is going to get a high percentage of them. Um, and if he can kind of improve that catch rate, then he should be a force in PPR leagues. I don't see his touches really getting much higher than nine to, you know, 13 in that range. But I think Morris should probably handle 14 to 15, 16, 17 carries a game plus all the goal line work. Um, so I would definitely go Brita in a full PPR. I would go Morris in a standard easily. Um, half PPR is where, you know, is where the question actually lies. That's where like when people just ask me straight up Morris or Brita, my mind initially just goes to half PPR right away because those are all the leagues I play in. And, uh, I guess I got to put my money where my mouth is. Last, last night I had a bid put in for Morris. One of my leagues, Morris and Brita were both on the wire. I put a $21 bid in for Morris. I put a $20 bid in for Brita, both going for the same guy, or both dropping the same guy. So if I missed out on Morris, then I would get Brita, but I didn't want both of them. So I would not suggest trying to get both of them because you're going to use a lot of fab budget on two guys that I don't see either of them. The problem is that Carlos Hyde finished as what, like RB10 last year? Neither of them are going to get the workload that Carlos Hyde did. Like Alfred Morris might get the carry number, right? He might hit those 240 carries that Hyde did last year, but he's not going to catch 60 passes. So his ceiling is lower than Carlos Hyde last year. But Breida obviously is not going to get all the work that Hyde got last year either. So you're probably vying for an RB2 that gives you a touchdown maybe every other week um, and will get a a solid volume workload floor. Putting my money where my mouth is, I guess that tells you that I bet more on Morris in half PPR league in the fab. So that's, I guess that's where that lies. My, My choice would be Morris. However, I want 
a piece of one of these guys if I can get either of them in my leagues. So definitely try to get one of the two if you can. Morris would be my preferred option in standard half PPR. Breida would be the guy in full PPR. I also wouldn't blow the bank on either of them. I would suggest putting in a fab budget, <coughs> budget of 20 to 25 percent if I'm in one of your leagues. Remember, guys, it's a long year. The season hasn't even started yet, so wouldn't suggest going out there and blowing like 40 percent or 60 percent of your budget. 20 to 25 is okay. Since I know you guys are all going to ask me, what round do I pick them? What round do I pick them, guys? Well, first of all, you have to be able to read your draft. You got to know your draft and know when to pick them. I can't just it can't just be a one size fits all. And I tell you, pick them in the seventh round, and that stands for every league type, every scoring setting every league because it depends what your league size is it depends what your scoring are if you have bonus points and shit like that so i'll tell you my rankings right now so in my half ppr rankings i have alfred morris at rb31 i have brita at rb37 but it's a close gap between the two of them a few guys that i still have uh, above morris i have um peyton barber i have carry on johnson i have ingram um the ingram with jonathan williams getting cut i'm a little higher on ingram now because that tells me that that role is probably secured for Ingram when he comes back, as long as Kamara doesn't take on the fully feature workload, um, which still might happen. But um, I have Ingram, Tevin Coleman, and Sonny Michelle above Alfred Morris right now. Uh, Chris Carson is behind Alfred Morris. Carlos Hyde is behind him. Adrian Peterson is behind him. So just to give you an idea of guys that are behind and in front of Alfred Morris. Um, but yeah, RB31 for Morris and RB37 for Brita. If you miss out on that, there will be other running backs that replenish the wire over the, uh, the course of the season, but if you guys have any other good insight on the topic, I would love to hear that down below. I'd like to hear your opinions because sometimes what you guys say sways me, um, but that's what I got for you today, and if you enjoyed, make sure you hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and I will see y'all tomorrow because tomorrow's the E-Town Get Down. I'll actually probably go uh, be live streaming in about an hour or so, so I'll see y'all then. Peace.